All right, we are recording. Is the first session? Would, is that recorded as a webinar? It was, yeah. It? Yeah, yeah. So that that should be under our first meeting uh, post. There okay. should be a link over there, uh, so you can go ahead and for all of the people that can't join us, uh, uh, this will be posted as well. Hello, Great. Caroline. Hello. All right. Uh, should we get into it? Any questions before we we dive in? Okay. No, just you're 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 basically working as a general pediatrician, right? Is that correct? Uh, yes, and uh, as a consultant for you know the train wrecks uh, that that get sent my way. Okay. Uh, do you, you know, do the, a lot of autism, ADHD, everything, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, the kids that I see, I, I don't actually consult with like the full-blown autistics, uh, the non-verbals uh, I send to, you know, other gifted people in the area. The, the verbal kids who are acting autistic that, that are going bonkers, th those are the kids I love working with. Okay, and good, uh, good, good. we'll actually touch on some of that because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool, simple things. Issues, right, and hypotonia. Yeah. Great, thank yeah. you. Go ahead. Sure, sure. All right, so I will share my screen. And what I'm going, to, actually, if I can ask you guys to temporarily mute yourselves, and then that way, um, as needed, you guys can jump in. All right, so the, the mitochondria. Why, why did I choose to talk about the mitochondria first? And let me get my computer working. It does not want to work right now. There we go. So to really understand why the mitochondria are integral, um, I, I want to present to you the concept of the terrain. And I don't know how many of you have heard of this before, have been exposed to it, but the, the conversation around the terrain was really integral to Kamyar's teaching of endobiogeny to us. And the way to look at the terrain is basically the terrain is the internal, oh, that was not supposed to happen. There we go. The terrain is basically the internal milieu of the human body that ultimately dictates pretty much everything and anything that happens. So for instance, if you look at, you know, just right now with the coronavirus, why is it that some children go on to develop, you know, this multi-systemic immune response? Or why do some adults at, at any age go on to develop this weird acute respiratory distress syndrome that's actually different than what they typically see? You know, we're, we're so focused on the virus. No one's saying, well, what the hell is different about the human beings and the children who go on to develop these weird manifestations? You know, even in the adult population, even in the 80, 90 year olds, not everyone goes on to die, right? That there are plenty of elderly adults that are actually absolutely fine. And I have some of those in my practice where the grandparents that are living with the kids got coronavirus and the 83 year old had two or three days of a fever, a little cough, and they went on. The conversation of the terrain asks, what is it about the human body and what is it about the internal milieu collectively. So every organ system, every physiological aspect of that human being, collectively, how does that create a scenario where either health can thrive or disease will manifest? And this concept is really, really important for all of you to start looking at. So as you're interacting with your patients, and I'm sure some of you already do this, but what I find with our current teaching of functional medicine we focus a lot on the gut. We focus a lot on one or two systems, and we think those systems are all that there is. And the conversation in the terrain kind of blows this up and, and basically says anything and everything from our gastrointestinal tract to our immune function to the mitochondrial function, pancreatic function, uh, the nervous system and how it's wired, the structure, how all of these collectively create the internal milieu. And really the way to look at the terrain is in, in one circumstance, you can have this totally dried out useless soil where nothing can grow. And that is essentially the soil where disease and problems can manifest. Or you can have a really rich fertile soil where health prospers and health is abundant because everything is driving itself towards that. And part of what I believe is that the mitochondria are actually one of the foundational pieces that will ultimately dictate the type of terrain that we end up having. 
And if there is a mitochondrial metabolic error, you can actually end up in more of this dry terrain versus this uh, ar arid, beautiful soil. And part of why I'm bringing this up is this conversation is really foundational for us to have all of our other building blocks on. So what are one of the most metabolically sensitive organs? The muscle, right? So the, the skeletal muscles are very, very sensitive organs. And why I'm starting off with this is it is probably the easiest way for you to detect and become aware of this in your patients. So you know, as you are starting to keep moving on and you're seeing more patients in your practice, part of what I really want to encourage you to do is to actually, you know, as you're interacting with your patients, ask like, well, does this kiddo have a metabolic disorder? And you'll probably see that th this is actually a way more common than we realize. Uh, I would venture to guess to say that five to 10% of the kids in your practice, the, the normal healthy kids that you wouldn't suspect an issue with actually have some degree of a metabolic error. So part of why the skeletal muscle are important is one, they impact lymphatics in venous circulation. So you think about venous flow, how, how, how does venous flow work, right? Why, why do adults, you know, elderly especially have to get up and move in the airplanes? It's because they have to contract their skeletal muscles. And through that contraction is how the venous blood flow comes back. Venous blood flow is a passive flow, right? There is no active pressure in the venous system to actually push the blood back. The lymphatics are actually quite similar. You need some degree of muscle activation to really get the lymphatics going. Uh, another thing that we don't really think about is mastication. I mean, think about mastication. What is involved in the act of chewing and eating? Chewing and eating just doesn't happen on its own, right? It's not like you just shove food in your mouth and the food magically digests and then ends up in your gastrointestinal tract and you know, digestion occurs. Mastication is actually a very, very energy intensive, complicated process. And if there are any issues with the skeletal muscles, and for all of you, I want you to think about young infants that you have had who were the kind of hypotonic floppy babies, you know, the, the ones that weren't rolling on time, weren't crawling on time, and then go and look to see how many of these kids had some degree of a feeding issue. Uh, th these are things that we don't connect. Uh, a lot of these kids that have low tone end up becoming the quote unquote picky eaters. You know, the kids that only eat mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And, you know, while you guys are hounding the parents of like, okay, well, give them more vegetables, get them to eat. No, no one is talking about the fact that some of these kids just simply don't know how to eat because they're, they're so hypotonic within their muscles of mastication that eating for them is such a chore. Same thing if you take these kids and you, you tell the parents like, okay, go run them for two miles. There's no way they can run for two miles. They, they fatigue so quickly, so easily that they, they, they just ask to be carried. So th these are things that I really encourage you to look at because it is one, very, very easy to overlook. And you know, for all of you that, that are all about treating the gut, good luck treating the gut if your kid can't chew. You know, if these kids are biting pieces of food whole and sending, you know, these big globs of undigested food into the intestinal tract, at some point, their pancreas is not going to be able to digest this food. And yes, you can use digestive enzymes and do all of these backward somersaults to actually improve digestion. If they can't chew, they can't chew. And if they can't chew, digestion can't occur. So th these are all things that you really need to think about because while it's absolutely important to treat the gut and it's absolutely important to address intestinal permeability and you need to be thinking about dysbiosis, well, none of those things could really be fixed until mastication starts. And mastication is entirely dependent on adequate skeletal muscle functioning and tone. And it's actually kind of weird when you address some of these metabolic issues, some of these kids that, that are picky eaters, quote unquote, all of a sudden, two or three months later, are now eating vegetables, they're diversifying their diet, it, parents are able to introduce new foods, these kids are actually interested in eating. And why are they interested in eating? Because eating is no longer a chore, they don't get exhausted when they chew. 
So you, you have to look at these things in this way. You know, like for me, when, when people ask me like, well, how do you treat SIBO? I, I treat SIBO by first getting the gut to actually start working. I mean, think about just the, the gut itself. What is it? What is the intestinal tract? A whole lot of muscle, right? You can't have intestinal, perme uh, intestinal uh, the myomotor function, the, the complex, which actually moves the bolus of food along. You can't have that to happen efficiently unless there is good mitochondrial function. And part of, uh, for instance, that case that, that just got posted, what, what is the primary, I don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, th there's a really beautiful case that we, we just got where the child has a diagnosed mitochondria mitochondrial error. And one of the things that's, that's there is he has longstanding history of constipation. And this is actually something that's very well known in the kids that have a full outright mitochond mitochondropathy. Uh, they, these kids are notorious for having the worst cases of constipation ever. Why? Because th their gut is not moving. These muscles are not contracting. And if the muscles aren't contracting, obviously the food bolus is not getting moved along. So of course you're going to have digestive issues. Of course you're going to have SIBO because why wouldn't you have SIBO if there is no motility pushing everything down? So you have to really start reconfiguring your thought patterns and really start reconsidering why things happen. And instead of just charging in and saying, okay, I'm going to use L-glutamine to fix the leaky gut, or I'm going to use blah, blah, blah to, to start addressing this gut issue, you have to first stand back and say, well, could this kid chew? You know, and if the kid can't chew, then what, is, what good is L-glutamine if you, if you haven't addressed the primary thing that set everything off in the first place? So by, by looking at the ter terrain and looking at the child as a whole, and really standing back and saying, well, what the hell was the first thing that crippled this child's system in its ability to function? That is when you can really start understanding why these kiddos have the challenges that they do. And what I really want to focus on today, one of the things, is why movement is so important. Uh, for those of you who have your video on, just raise your hand. How many of you are familiar with sensory processing disorder? Okay, good. So why does sensory processing disorder happen? Have, have any of you actually thought about it? Like why, I mean, we treat it, we, we send them to occupational therapy. I'm really happy that all of you know about it, but why the hell do these kids end up with all of these funky issues in the first place? And you know, like why, are, why is their nervous system and its ability to process information so screwed up? Like why, why did this happen? Why do some kids end up with sensory processing disorders and other kids don't? Well, one of the things that's, and, and just to touch on this, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this data, but the vast majority of kids that have ADHD have sensory processing disorder. So, you know, you know in time, what we're, we're going to find is that this ADHD diagnosis is actually fairly inaccurate. And a lot of these kids and a hell of a lot of kids with autism actually have sensory processing disorder as, the, as they're probably the primary issue. So the, these scattered brain kids, these kids that can't focus, these kids that can't pay attention, these kids that are getting in trouble, a lot of them have this condition as one of their root issues. And then that then begs the question, well, why do these poor kids end up with this condition in the first place? And th this is an article that uh, I think is, is a really great read for all of you. And if you want, I can post it to the forum. Uh, and it's by this gal named Williams. And basically what she says in, I'm going to do one thing so I can actually see all of this myself. There we go. Uh, basically the foundation of human thought and behavior have their origins in action. And uh, this is probably one of the most important quotes, at least I've, I've ever seen. And part of what she goes on to say is that cognitive development is ultimately intertwined with movement activities. And all of that lays the foundation for the next level of brain development. Ultimately, crawling and a lot of other movement activities provides a state of hand-eye coordination, vestibular processing. What the hell is vestibular processing? It's, it's our ability to know oneself in space and time. So... Vestibul the vestibular system is what gives us our sense of balance. The proprioceptive systems are what give us our, our sense of coordination in space. 
they give us balance and equilibrium, spatial awareness. So all of these things are, are critical and they come from crawling. They come from movement. And as these babies and kids move and think about all the kiddos that you have in your practice that struggle to crawl, that, that don't roll over on time, that, that they're the kids that just sit on their butts and ultimately get up and start walking. What are they not doing? They're not stimulating these neural pathways that are ultimately needed for a sense of body position and self-control. And she goes on to say that ultimately through crawling and movement and all of these things, you're developing these neural foundations that ultimately are critical for vision and proprioception. And vision and proprioception are integral for a child to actually be able to regulate themselves. And uh, just more about the visual spatial perception. And part of why I'm bringing this up is these concepts, and you know, we'll probably circle back to these in a future conversation because they're, they're so important. All of these are critical for a kid's ability to actually be able to learn. Children cannot learn. They cannot sit still. They can't pay attention. They cannot be focused and concentrated if they lack these foundational pieces. And the visual spatial perception is one of these things. So you, you, the kids that you have in your practice that are really smart, but for whatever reason, their grade levels uh, with their reading capacity is well below what is expected. That's because they probably have, they probably have a vis visual spatial perception error. The, these are the kids that are clumsy. These are the kids that skip lines. These are the kids that reverse letters. These are the kids that you know, are, are for whatever reason, uh, like two, three grade levels below where they should be with reading. There's a reason for that. Now, why, why are we talking about all of this and what the hell does that have to do with the mitochondria, right? So all of the crazy things that kids do to basically kill themselves, you know, all the things that parents are, are getting crazy about, they're like, oh my God, he crashed again or whatever else. Those are actually fantastic. Those are necessary for kids to integrate their nervous systems into their bodies. And part of why I'm really sensitive about this is actually this little girl. So Lana, this is my little three-year-old daughter. Uh, Lana was actually the, the little one that helped me wake up to all of this. So I, I've been treating kids with sensory processing issues for a very, very long time. And Lana, when she was you know, born early, early on, I was like, holy crap, like she has really low tone. And, you know, by four months, she, she was just, she was definitely not rolling over. By six months, still not rolling over. Forget about getting on all fours. She hated tummy time. And this is one of the things that comes up a lot. So a lot of these kids, when they're put on their tummy, because they're so hypotonic and they, they literally can't even lift up their trunk or their head, uh, tummy time for them is a real pain. By 11 months, she still had not actually crawled. And given everything that I know, you know, I was just like, oh, great. She's going to be wired exactly like me. And I've got a lot of sensory processing issues. So, you know, I, I already saw my daughter's trajectory ending up exactly where I was. And my childhood was not fun. Uh, so, you know, I got to a point where I'm like, great. My, my daughter screwed. Like my daughter screwed. And my wife didn't want me to supplement her. We had her, we had her working with two different PTs. Like it was such a fiasco. You guys would be laughing to you if you saw what I was doing. And finally at 11 months of age, my, my wife gave me consent to, you know, treat my daughter as the earliest guinea pig experiment of my career. And I ended up giving her some carnitine and CoQ10. And within two weeks, I kid you not, within two weeks, this little went, girl went from dragging herself on the floor to full quadruped crawl, like perfect crawl without any kind of issues. And then a week later, she started standing up. Two weeks later, she started walking. Like it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Uh, and I think now I've started treating, I think the earliest is like a seven month old seven or eight month old uh, that, that is hypotonic. And you know, these kinds of things would seem not that important, except they're, they're actually integral. So uh, you know, definitely go and read William's article because by the time you're done reading it, you're like, holy shit, like every kid needs to crawl. And if they don't crawl, like uh, they're just set up for a world of hurt down the road. Uh, her article plus my experience with Lana really put me in a place where the mitochondria started coming way to the top because without movement and a child's ability to 
confidently and securely engage their body. And, and think about the kids that you have that are hypotonic. When they jump, what happens to them? They fall, right? They, 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 don't, they lack the core strength. They, last, they lack the muscle strength to catch themselves when they fall. So when they're doing these crazy jumps, the kids that are hypotonic jump when they, when they attempt to, and they fall because they can't stop themselves effectively. So after a few times of jumping, what do they do? They stop jumping because every time they fall, they won't run very fast because what they do and they try to pivot, they, they go in the wrong direction because they can't engage their core to actually move their bodies. And these are things that are really, really important and, you know, right now in medicine, at least when I was in training, you know, we were taught to look for these catastrophes, right? For all, all of us in residency, they're like, okay, these, these are the metabolic disorders. These are the things you look for because kids will die if they have this. And I'm sure all of you, you know, in, in your PEDS ICU rotations and, you know, wherever else, you, you probably saw one or two of these cases and you'll never forget them because they're, they're awful to see. But what if... All, all we're looking at in that scenario is the worst of the worst. What if there's a whole spectrum, right? And you've got the Lee syndrome and the Melis kids over here, except there, there's this middle ground of this weird guy, right? And the middle ground is actually where 5 to 10% of your patients lay, where by, by conventional pediatric norms, they're actually considered normal because my daughter would be considered normal. I'm, I'm considered normal, even though I, I now realize I have some element of a mitochondropathy. So what we call normal is actually not normal. And what, what is considered okay is, is definitely suboptimal. And the entire reason, I mean, just look at his muscle structure. Why is this guy all scrawny? And, and when you look at a lot of your kids that are hypotonic, they're not buff. They don't look like this. They look like this. So, and what do these kids have? A lot of them have digestive issues. A lot of them have atypy. So th there's this weird constitution and constitution is basically this physical build that, that has, that kind of presents itself over and over again. And when you look for this, you'll, you'll see the same kind of pattern show up. The kid has weird ner nervous system issues. A lot of these kids are high strung. A lot of these kids have some degree of digestive issue. They have some degree of ATP with a weird immune response. They're, they're, they're the skinny, scrawny kids. And part of why I ask you to contemplate what failure to thrive is, I mean, you look at just the build of this guy. Well, why is it that he lacks muscle? You know, it, well, why, why do hypotonic kids lack muscle? Is it just because they're not moving? And you, you'll see plenty of people when you look around that, that don't exercise at all and they're just buffed all the time. Like, for any of you, look at Elon Musk. He, he, he is outright set. He doesn't exercise. Like all that guy does is sit there and type on a computer and, you know, go and talk to people. He doesn't work out. Look at his constitution. The guy is gigantic. His muscle build is absurd. That has to do with his constitution, which ultimately has to do with his physiological functioning. And the mitochondria play a bigger part in this than we can possibly imagine. And as you start looking through each of these categories of how the mitochondria impact physiology, you get to a place where you're like, holy shit, like it is actually foundational and it can dictate ultimately who ends up like this versus who ends up like this. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that, but the mitochondria play a bigger role than we realize. And I guess just, just to go with this, you know, if, if a child has this kind of a constitution and, and our little one who's now four months, it, it's weird. He is so absurdly strong and all he does is kick and move. And we can already see like he, he's going to be the terror, you know, one-year-old that's going to be climbing everything. And his constitution is the type that would allow him to engage his vestibular systems, his proprioceptive systems. He's the kid that's going to be running. And I know for a fact that, you know, minus him just being a little hyper because he wants to constantly run and move, he won't have the same kind of sensory processing and challenges that my daughter would, for instance, because of that movement in integration. And the OTs, Part of what they do is what? They, they put these kids into different kinds of activities, put them into different kinds of movements to ultimately integrate their brain. If the kid moves and runs and plays all the time, they're essentially doing OT on their own, right? 
if, if you've ever, if you haven't actually go find an OT that does sensory integration and just go sit there for, you know, two hours and look at the activities they do. Essentially what they're doing is uh, this. They're getting these kids to roll. They're getting these kids to crawl and crash. And they're getting these kids to do what they normally should do if they were active and fully engaged in their bodies. And the low muscle tone, when you start looking for it, is, is so eerily common that you'll, you'll get to a place where you're like, holy cow, how have I not seen all of this? And I really encourage you to start looking for these things and then looking for the clusters because usually it's not just they have low muscle tone. They have a plethora of other issues on top of it. And, you know, these comments of parents saying, oh, you know, she, she's not so athletic or, oh, he's so clumsy. You know, they're, they're just a gentle child. You know, he likes to sit and play quietly by himself while the kids are running around in the, in the playground. There's a reason for this. This isn't just kids are shy and reserved and antisocial. You know, if, if a five-year-old has any of these descriptions, there's a reason for it. it these kids are not engaging because something is hindering them. Five-year-olds don't choose to be playing quietly on their own. And these are things that you really need to take into account. And when these kinds of comments come up, these should actually set off flags in your mind of like, okay, is there something going on that's keeping this child from being engaged in the way that they, they want to be? And I'll, I'll just share this case with you because uh, more of the test results are, are so fascinating. So he, he's a 12-year-old that came to see me with this plethora of interesting diagnoses and ultimately was put on meds because of the anxiety and depression, which the meds kind of barely suppressed his symptoms. Uh, in this 12-year-old, when I... I probed far enough into his history, the mom is like, yeah, he never crawled. He was really late to walk. Like, I think he started walking in like 16 months of age. Super, super anxi uh, anxiety written, unable to focus. He's in the classroom. Everything sets him off. Definitely not the most active. He'll, he'll run the mile, but he's, he's the last to finish. He has no friends because he's constantly anxiety written. And you know, as we kept talking, you know, I told him like, okay, what the hell is going on? And, you know, my initial thought with him was he had a gut issue. So we treated his gut, cleaned up his diet, blah, 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 blah. He got a little bit better. He went on summer break and he's like, wow, I feel amazing. I'm like, cool. And then he went back to school and all of a sudden he's like, I, I can't handle it. I'm like, what the hell? He's like, yeah, I had to go hide in a bathroom because the, the classroom was too loud. I'm like, What? And, you know, long behold, he actually had sensory processing disorder. And I did the urine organic acids on him and his fatty acid oxidation profile was just a hot mess. And why, and this is part of why I bring this up is this is actually probably the primary metabolic error that a lot of these kids have. And just as a summary for all of you to kind of take you back to the painful days of biochemistry. You know, ultimately the foods that we eat just don't magically turn into fuel, right? And, and th these are all things that, that we take for granted and we think that they just happen. Th these things don't, don't happen. Fats, when we eat them, don't just magically turn into ATP, right? They, they actually have to go through a pretty profound and complicated biochemical process and ultimately, the fats and everything else have to get dumped into acetyl-CoA, and ultimately, they go and go through everything else, and you ultimately end up with ATP. You look at this guy's Jonas profile. What did he have? He had elevations, some markedly elevated in these different errors. And if you look right here, so he was not able to convert fat to this. And part of why I bring this up with my daughter and with a lot of the young kids that I see, I don't even treat the entire citric acid cycle. Part of what I do is a lot of them, when I just give them carnitine with a tiny bit of CoQ10, like that's all they need and they start doing really well. And I think when you probe enough of your kids, you'll find that the fatty acid oxidation is probably where they have the defect. And what was really cool with Jonah is when I treated him and put him on this cocktail and put him on some CoQ10 and extra carnitine, you know, he comes back uh, probably a month 
later and all of a sudden his depression was gone and he was no longer feeling depressed. And think about what depression is. What, what does it mean to feel depressed? If you lack energy, you've got multiple organ systems that don't run well, including the brain. And part of what's really interesting with a lot of these kids, and we'll touch on this in a tiny bit, is they just feel really tired and sluggish at, at multiple different levels, which is essentially what depression kind of feels like, right? So there was that. We plugged them into a sensory integration program and you know, four months after doing that with the mitococto, like his anxiety was gone. It was, it was actually really weird to see how well he did. So all of these things are possible. And our job should be to make sure that there are no 12 year old Jonas in the world, because we're catching these things so early and addressing them when these kids are four or five, so that they don't end up in those shoes. And there's a lot of these kids like Jonah out there. I'm sure you, you have a lot of them in your practice. And I really encourage you to actually go back and look at the constitutional makeup of these kids and look at the underlying complaints that these kids have uh, in terms of why they have the issues that they do. But the story gets a, a hell of a lot more interesting and we'll, we'll touch on some of these things. But the brain is something we don't really think about. How, how many of you, if, for those of you that have your video on a show of hands, how many of you have actually thought about how the brain works as it pertains to the mitochondria and metabolic functioning. All right, we, we've got, okay, good, good. Okay, more than not, more than not, but think about it. Uh, and, you know, to put this in context, I, I think these the studies are, are really interesting to think about. So th these are people with full outright mitochondrial disease. So th th they went to a conventional geneticist or metabolic specialist, they probably did my muscle biopsy, which is not fun, and had it confirmed. A lot of these people end up with rather intense psychiatric manifestations. And when, when you just think about the brain itself in neural functioning, you know, and, and ask yourself, like, how do these neurons actually do what they do? You know, again, we take for granted that the neurons just work, right? We, we take for granted that the, the nervous system just does things magically on its own and everything just should take place. No, the mitochondria are critical for neuronal functioning. I mean, just uh, go, go, again, going back to the days of physiology and biochem, the ion ingredients, how, how the hell do we create ion gradients for neurons to ultimately transmit things, the signals down to the synapse? How about just the release of the vesicles and the, the movement of the receptors? All of these things take a hell of a lot of energy, a lot of energy, and we, we, we take that for granted. So when you have a metabolic disorder, the skeletal muscle is the area that it presents with or two most obviously, right? Because these kids don't crawl and move and you can see it. You know, like a, a test that I do for these kids that I, I, I have them, I ask them to climb up on the exam table and our exam table is pretty high. And there are some kids that just jump on the exam table. And then there are other kids that are like acting like they're climbing a mountain, you know, and it's, it's like a four foot climb. So when, when you look at these things, it's not just the mitochondria are hitting the, the skeletal muscle and everything the skeletal muscle does, they're also affecting neuronal functioning and neuronal signaling. I mean, think about just sending vesicles to the synapse to dump out whatever you know, neurochemical there is. How does that happen? These things just don't happen on their own. These are energy intensive processes and this concept of synaptic fatigue is actually something that I really hope to drive into your brains because when you look at what ADHD is, what is ADHD? It's ultimately one, a lot of sensory issues that have happened because these kids are not moving and they're developing all of these sensory integration problems, but they're also having cellular or lack of cellular communication at the brain level. And right there. And part of what, what makes this even more interesting, so the prefrontal cortex is where a lot of sensory inf information ultimately gets organized and then passed on to the rest of the brain. And within the prefrontal cortex, we have these funny GABAergic inner neurons that are actually really important. I can't stress this enough. They're really important and actually 
controlling the excitatory signaling that will then take place within the prefrontal cortex. And under normal conditions, the, these paraventricular or paravalbumin, I can say it correctly, inner neurons are highly, highly active to actually inhibit a lot of excitatory information from getting passed along. So they actually dampen distracting information. They're, they're literally the braking system of the brain. What do these suckers need? A hell of a lot of energy. So when there is a mitochondrial error, when there's a metabolic problem, not only do you have neuronal communication errors and there's synaptic fatigue and all kinds of other weird things are happening, the interneurons that are there to actually slow the, the neuronal communication that, that can ultimately set off a cascade of excitatory processes is ultimately hindered. So look at the kids that you have that have weird anxiety patterns. Look at the kids you have that are ultimately diagnosed with whatever autism spectrum is a perfect example. Like it's starting to really get to me when I see these totally healthy, happy kids are labeled as autistic spectrum because they're just weird. What makes them weird? What causes them to flip out? What causes them to go berserk? There's a reason for that. And this actually is playing a much bigger part than we realize in that process. So ultimately, part of what this author went on to say is that deficits in these uh, inner neurons are ultimately associated with various kinds of behavioral defects that we see in autism spectrum and, and schizophrenia. But the fun just doesn't stop right there. Let's talk about these adrenal glands. How the hell do we produce hormones? How does hormonal function or hormonal production take place? Do, do hormones just magically appear in our body? How, how, do we, how do we produce hormones? Steroid hormones, so testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, cortisol, what, what do these things ultimately get produced by? They, they actually get produced by the mitochondria. So the, the various organs, the testes, the ovaries, the adrenal glands, the, the, these organs just don't magically pump out compounds, right? You ultimately take cholesterol, right? Presuming there's enough of it in the diet. And ultimately, there are multiple enzymatic processes that have to be done. So all of these little arrows, you know, all, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys remember, you know, the trauma of trying to learn all of this, right? Go, go, go back to your biochemistry days and, and the trauma, at least I was traumatized in, in trying to learn and memorize all of this. But all, all, these little, you know, three beta HSD, what are these? What are these? These are enzymes, right? These are enzymes. What do these enzymes require to take this estrone to estradiol? How do we go from 11-deoxycortisol to cortisol? Does, does that just happen? Like, how does that happen? These are all enzymatic processes that are heavily, 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 heavily dependent on energy. And if there is a mitochondrial error, guess what happens? These processes do not happen efficiently. Why is that kid that I showed you scrawny? Why are a lot of the kids that have metabolic error scrawny? Because they can't produce hormones efficiently. Cortisol production is shot in these guys. They don't produce a whole lot of growth hormone. They don't produce a lot of testosterone. So th th these, these constitutions that you, you see in these kids, the failure to thrive picture, think about what failure to thrive is. It's not just a gut issue. It's actually way more complicated than that. Their entire pituitary functioning, their entire hormonal functioning is just sh shot to hell. You know, these kids that in your practice that are in the first percentile, the fifth percentile, they've always been in the, in the percentiles. When, when you look at them and you see like, oh, yeah, they're also not the most active of all kids. You know, they, they go run a little bit. They fatigue. You know, there's an entire picture that starts showing up once you start knowing how to look for it. And the mitochondria are actually underneath a lot of this picture. Not, not all of it. There, there's a lot more to this than, than just that. So don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying like you fix the mitochondria, everything gets better but they are foundational for the systemic functioning. And if these processes are not happening efficiently, you're going to get a world of hurt. And 
ultimately anything and everything that you try just does not work well because at an enzymatic foundational terrain level, everything is just stuck. And, you know, the adrenal glands are organs that we take for granted. And part of why I'm, I'm bringing this up is, you know, down the road, we'll talk about, you know, plants like Ribes digram, Rosacanina, Rosemary, Quercus. So these are all plants that actually hit the adrenal glands. And these are all plants that actually upregulate the adrenal glands and help it in its state of functioning. And some of them have different properties, such as pushing things more towards cortisol versus towards other sex hormones. Try putting these plants in a kid who has crappy mitochondrial functioning and see what happens. You know, and early on, you know, it was weird to me because I would use these plants and on some kids, it would be like magical. Like they would work so well that I would even be floored. And then I would have these other kids where I would have to use like three times the dose and it would still just produce a really crappy, just unremarkable result. And I, I kept asking myself, like, why the hell is it that some kids respond and some kids don't? And finally, what I realized is that if these kids lack the metabolic functioning, these plants can't do anything. These plants are not hormone replacements. We're not replacing the hormones. These plants help the organs become more active in their state of functioning. And at a cellular enzymatic level, if these organs cannot function, if these organs cannot efficiently do what they're supposed to do, you know, that's like having a car that is beat up and broken and out of shape. So take like my 10 year old Prius and then, you know, have it not have a, had a tune up in a million years. It, the plants push the accelerator down. If the car is beat up and broken and out of tune, you could push the accelerator as hard as you want. Nothing is going to happen. So that, that is why we first need to understand how do we get the human body in an optimal place at a foundational enzymatic level to then allow other things to actually work more efficiently. And this, this is just a summary of, you know, what the poor adrenal glands do and all the hard work they do. All of this, all of these little arrows that you learned at some point, probably in time that, that we all forgot, you know, happily, I think, uh, these all take energy. All of these take a lot of energy and these things don't happen on their own. And th this is something that I, I just, hope to drive into your brain because th this is actually really important to understand. And th this is just another article specifically talking about the adrenal glands. And basically what they say is you cannot discuss adrenal functioning without the mitochondria. Th they are integrally inter intertwined and without the mitochondria working well, there, there's basically no adrenal gland function. And you know where this becomes really important is Probably a third of the kids you see in your practice who have weird, uh, and th these are even two, three-year-olds. So the two, three-year-olds who have the tantrums, that the kids that are you know really difficult, the kids that just lose their minds over nothing. And I'm sure you've all seen this if, if you've been practicing pediatrics long enough. All of these kids, the vast majority of them, actually have an adrenal imbalance. And part of what's really interesting about the adrenal glands, and we don't really think about this, and Kamyar, you know, was the one that helped me wake up to this, is there's actually a feedback loop. And cortisol goes back up into the pituitary and uh, hypothalamus and actually provides a negative feedback loop. When there's an inadequate amount of cortisol, you get an upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system because ACTH and ultimately CRH are ultimately controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So, you know, this, this comment that you, you hear in the adults, tired but wired, think about that. What the hell does that mean? What, what does tired but wired mean? And I don't know if any of you have had, you know, adrenal fatigue. Uh, I've, I've certainly had my fair share of it. Adrenal fatigue is basically when you lack the cortisol. So Let's go back to this. So when cortisol is, is crappy in its levels, when it's inadequate, you, you don't get this feedback response. In fact, there's an actually up regulation because the body is naturally trying to get the adequate amount of cortisol and DHEA and pregnenolone and all of these things. It, it needs 
this inadequate amounts to ultimately get physiological processes to happen. And the body's intelligence, when you look at it, the body could care less if a kid is, is acting crazy or not, right? Physiologically, the human body could care less if a kid is having tantrums, if they're losing their mind. You know, the, the nervous system at the end of the day is actually irrelevant in many ways in terms of the human body and, and what it sees as the highest good and goal of the child. And the human body will compensate at any and every level to get what it needs done even if that means that it's causing a kid to go completely haywire or crazy. Because at the end of the day, if growth and health are happening, who cares? That, that's how the body, human body sees it. So it will cause upregulation. And, and for those of you that have ever tried treating anxiety symptomatically, I don't, I, I don't know how many of you have actually been able to do that uh, successfully. But in the last uh, talk that we did, part of what I was talking about is, you know, I used to try doing gobs and gobs of Roman chamomile. I'm sure you, you guys, you know, if, if you've played with this long enough, you've had cases where, you know, a parent or you recommended some kind of calming blend and you give the calming blend, the calming blend works for, you know, a brief period of time of a few weeks, if that, and then all of a sudden the kid goes crazy again. Have you guys ever seen that? So that, that kid going crazy again is you try to slow down this because the sympathetic nervous system is sitting here pushing all of this down you try to block this you try to slow this down and ultimately you ended up accidentally slowing this down and the human body basically says you know f you like you have no idea what the hell you're doing i'm just going to overcompensate and you think you can slow things down good luck let me, let me just push things up to a level and then try to stop this physiologically we cannot stop what the human body is trying to do and if we do the human body just punches us in the face and just knocks us out of the way so you have to understand why these things are off and for instance with ribes part of what it does is it actually does a beautiful job hitting this area of the adrenal glands and really upregulates cortisol functioning presuming the mitochondria are working and once ribes actually balance this balances out the cortisol levels, this actually goes up, produces the feedback loop. And in a lot of the kids, if you give them like two to three drops of a ribes gemotherapy when they're going berserk, in the right scenario, the parents will come back a week later like, I don't know what the hell you did, but my kid is no longer tantruming. And that, that's part of this feedback loop. And you know, the adrenal glands, and we'll, we'll touch on this in future lectures in a lot more detail, have this really interesting pattern. So when you ask enough parents, like in the younger kids, if they have a nap in the afternoon, they just go crazy in the late afternoon, which is actually a sign of a drop in cortisol. A lot of these kids get this weird second win. And again, you'll see this in, in a cluster. You've got the scrawny kid who fatigues easily. They've got mood issues and they've got this pattern all on top of it. So a lot of these, you know, scrawny, weak looking kids that, that are having anxiety, ADHD, whatever, they, they basically have a trio of, of issues, if, if not more. They've got the crappy muscular system so they're not engaging the proprioceptive vestibular systems they've got the issues with the, the actual inner neurons in synaptic functioning so their brains the brain at a, at a cellular level is not functioning they've got a crappy adrenal gland so when, when you start putting these pieces together you get to a point where you're just like wow i'm, I'm surprised that you six-year-old with anxiety and adhd are actually doing as well as you are because your body is completely shot. But the things get a lot more interesting than that, right? So it's not just that these kids have problems with those organs. So these kids have issues with gastric motility. When, when you look at what, what, what is fat di absorption and digestion dependent on? Bile, right? If you don't have adequate bile and you don't have efficient release of that bile, how does digestion happen? It doesn't. The exocrine pancreas, just think about what the exocrine pancreas does. So the part of the pancreas that dumps out these pancreatic enzymes, how do we produce these pancreatic enzymes to dump into the gastrointestinal tract? Do we just have a, are we just born with this massive sack of digestive enzymes that get dumped out? Like, how does that happen? And these are all things that I really encourage you guys to look at because without these, oh, 
sorry, didn't mean to do that. Go back. So without these things, without these processes happening efficiently, there's a host of issues that can show up. And we have to take these things into account. Yes, you know, if a kid has constipation, sure, you can throw digestive enzymes. You can use, you know, whatever fancy herbal mixture to get their bowels moving. But if you haven't addressed their other pieces, if this kid at the age of five already has some degree of pancreatic insufficiency or they have inadequate bile function, you'll, you'll see some parents reporting to you that, you know, these kids' poops are just weird as hell. All of that is telling you that at a systemic level, there's probably more things deficient than we realize. And while you can replace some of these things, if you don't restore the, the, the functioning of these organs, have you ultimately done the kid any service? I'm almost done. Thank you. Next time. Okay. So like SIBO, think about what the hell SIBO is. What, what is SIBO and how, why does it happen? You know, uh, like eight years ago, I think it was probably a little bit more. If you look at the sheets that I would hand out to the parents, like you, you would probably laugh. You know, I, I would use these enzymes to break down the biofilms. I would use all kinds of antimicrobials. I would basically set off a nuclear bomb in these kids' gastrointestinal tracts. And, and the same thing with the adults, thinking like I was doing them such a huge service and half the time it would work, half the time it wouldn't, after a whole lot of weird effort. What is SIBO? SIBO is basically overgrowth of the bacteria in the intestines because the terrain of the small bowel is such that it has allowed these bacteria to overgrow. If acidity is off, if the motility is off, if there is inadequate bile, think about what bile is. Bile is the perfect antimicrobial. When bile gets dumped into the small bowel, it kills off any microbes that are there. So when there is an imbalance, and I couldn't find anything on hydrochloric acid production, so I have no idea if these kids have issues with hydrochloric acid production that, that I'm not smart enough to answer. But if these kids have at a systemic level the inability to actually produce these things that are integral for digestion, well, why wouldn't you? I mean, why wouldn't anyone end up with something like SIBO? So I really encourage you to, instead of just jumping on one diagnosis and treating, okay, well, this kid has SIBO, so I'm just going to treat their SIBO and everything is going to get better. Zoom way the hell out. And it's going to be a pain in the butt initially because you're, you're, you're going to get a place, get to a place where you, you become so questioning and insecure about a lot of the things that you're doing, which is actually a great place to be. Like when Kamiar started training me in the first year, I got to a place where I was scared to treat anyone for anything. And this is after like practicing for six to eight years. So it's good to get to a place where you start questioning anything and everything that you're doing, because that is where opportunities to really push your practice beyond where it is come. And I really encourage you to question what is SIBO? What is, what is the digestive imbalance? What are these things and where do they come from? Mm, yeah, we're going to skip this. So th th this is basically just to talk about the fact that the gallbladder is also impacted by the mitochondria and gallbladder motility also does not occur very efficiently if, if the mitochondria are, are inefficient in their functioning and the exocrine pancreas. So uh, the data is definitely there to suggest that a lot of these organ systems do not run well. Now, you may not end up with a full-blown pancreatitis. You may not end up with organ, obvious organ dysfunction. But collectively, if the kid can't chew, if their exocrine pancreas, let's say it's just 20 or 30% less efficient. And again, this is where there's a gray zone, right? So these articles talk about the catastrophes. And right now we're saying if there's not a catastrophe, everything else is normal. What I'm saying is that there's this entire middle ground where you may not ever know that the kid has a full-blown pancreatic disorder, but if their pancreatic enzymes are even 20, 30% less efficient than they would be otherwise, is that enough to start causing digestive issues? It may be. If the kid is not producing bile efficiently and dumping the bile out effectively and 
even it's 20 or 30% off, but you've also got a pancreatic issue and the kid is not digesting well and their gut motility is off. A little 5% here, a little 10% there, another 20% there. Collectively, as these things fall into place, all of a sudden you're just like, wow, these things can add up and cause a lot of problems. So these things collectively can cause a host of issues. And, and these kids that you have that are extreme picky eaters that are having oral sensory problems, stand back. There's usually one of two reasons, especially if this has been ongoing forever. So if, if you've, you know, if you go and ask the parent of the eight-year-old whose kid only eats mac and cheese and pasta and maybe one or two other foods, and you say, well, you know, how were they when they were two or three? And, you know, they were always like this chances are either this kid has had an ongoing metabolic issue and hypotonia in their mouth and they never learn how to eat or they have a tongue tie. Like there's one of two possibilities in scenarios like that. And these are the kids that are the hardest to treat because you can't treat their gut if the kid literally doesn't know how to eat. In probably in, at least in, in the populations of the, the sensory processing kids, the kids that I see, 10 to 20% of them actually have either a tongue tie or a metabolic issue that's causing them not to eat. And, and these kids to take them off gluten, dairy and do all of these, you know, intense elimination diets, they're just not capable of doing them because they don't know how to eat. And there's definitely discussion and I'm not even going to get into this, but ultimately the kidneys and the liver don't function well. And you can, read a lot about that if you want. And part of what's really interesting with the kidneys is also think about al al aldosterone, right? So if you look back to those diagrams that I shared with you, and you guys are welcome to you know, go back and watch this recording. If you have an imbalance in aldosterone and you've got crappy you know, renal function on top of that, you could get all kinds of one mineral absorption or mineral imbalances part of that coming from the gut, part of, part of that coming from the kidneys, you can get all kinds of things, not to the point where you're going to see anything that is medically diagnosable, right? And a lot of the kids that we see, they don't have any kind of thing that we can diagnose medically, right? They don't fit any diagnosis criteria. But when you look like a lot of these kids, their, their teeth are falling apart, uh, some of these kids actually have uh, rarely, but on occasion, I don't know if you've seen it, but I've seen it where the, these kids end up with osteopenia. That makes absolutely no sense. So there, there's a lot more to this picture than meets the eye when you actually start looking for it. And I'll just read this quote to you. And I posted some of the other articles in there because, you know, what got me to think about this in the first place was a lot of these kids that I saw were also just getting sick in a very unusual way. And it didn't always have to do with their gastrointestinal tract. So I had taken these kids off gluten and dairy and I treated their gut and we had done all of the gut protocols and they were still just getting sick way more often than they should. And part of what this author is talking about, and I posted these articles, so you guys are welcome to go back and look at it. So the concept that the mitochondria are simply the power plant of the cells has become obsolete. Nowadays, the mitochondria are considered as bioenergetic, biosynthetic, and signaling centers controlling a plethora of processes within the cells. And these T cells rely on a fine-tuned response from the mitochondria during their migration, activation, proliferation, differentiation, differentiation memory phase, and exhaustion. So pretty much every process cellular change that these T cells go through and you guys know this better than me, probably, how influential these T cells are on the total immune response. What, what they go on to say is without tight control of mitochondrial behavior, the immune responses are compromised. And the mitochondria are ultimately, I mean, just think about oxida the oxidative burst. Like how, how do these cells produce the oxidative bursts to kill off other organs or uh, other organs, to kill off uh, microbes? There's a lot more to this discussion than meets the eye. And part of what's really cool is when you actually start treating the mitochondria, you start getting normalization of immune behavior probably happening at the T cell and poss possibly even the dendritic level. 
move on here. So let's just get into the rest of this conversation. Hopefully we'll have some time. What time is it? Oh, gee. Okay. Uh, so we we'll just go through, fly through the rest of this real quick. So there is no perfect test. Uh, for those of you that hope that, you know, you can use one test to fix everything, it, it doesn't exist. So this is where, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we have to use this thing, right? Uh, and in medicine, sadly, even in functional medicine, it seems like, you know, people really don't want to trust this and they want to rely on their tests. There is no perfect test. So a lot of this will ultimately boil down to you really honing in your diagnostic clinical skills and through that, ultimately uh, dialing in, you know, how to identify this. The urine organic acids, uh, for those of you that have not been using them, are, are probably one of the most useful tools. So one, they give you all interesting markers uh, of fungal dysbiosis. And for instance, in some of the patients that I've had that have had mold exposure, you'll see these markers go up. And we'll, we'll talk about these tests in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to kind of tie this into what we're talking about. Um, most helpful is actually some of the markers that show up over here. So you can get some markers of mitochondrial function. Um, I, I actually included this uh, as one of my patients who's probably the most screwed up with his gastrointestinal tract. So oxalates are something that we'll talk about in a, in a future talk on the gastrointestinal tract. But the oxalates to me are actually one of the most sensitive tests for intestinal permeability. And of all of the tests that I have probed, well, these oxalates are probably the most accurate in terms of finding intestinal permeability. Um, this is the test of actually one of the dads in the practice. Uh, and, and we were talking about the kids and then the dad was like, yeah, you know, I've, I've got high cholesterol and I, I've always had crappy energy and, you know, I, I, I'm not that active because when I try to be active, I, I get uh, fatigue really easily. So we ran this on him just, just for, you know, curiosity sake. And he actually had some pretty impressive errors in fatty acid oxidation. And again, this is probably where you're going to find a lot of the issues in your kids. And there, there's this Midas swab. I've actually never used it because I just go and treat these kids. It's about $300. And for me, you know, using $50 of CoQ10 is, is ultimately with plus or minus some other supplements is ultimately a better way to go. But that test exists for any of you that are interested. So ultimately what I do is if I suspect that there is an error, I'll just go in and basically treat these kids. Sometimes I'll do the urine organic acid test to get information. Again, we'll touch on it in more detail. The other way to do it is just treat because fortunately with these supplements, you really would have to be, you know, borderline crazy in the dosing that you're giving these kids to cause any kind of toxicity. And probably the most useful of all of them are these two guys right here. So you could start with just a little bit of carnitine and CoQ10. Uh, Metagenics actually has a chewable CoQ10 that's 300 milligrams that pretty much all kids like. It, it's this, you know, pretty decent tasting uh, CoQ10. And I'll touch on another company in a second. And creatine, uh, there's a company, uh, Now Foods, which you can find uh, over the counter. They actually have a carnitine liquid that's 3,000 milligrams per teaspoon. And it actually tastes really good. We actually use it for my daughter. Uh, kids, kid, kids think it, one of them is candy and the other one's juice. And the carnitine, I think, is like 15 bucks for the bottle. And the CoQ10 is probably around $30, $40. So they're not super cheap, but the CoQ10 is going to last them two months. And the bottle of carnitine is also going to last them two months. And, you know, I, I encourage you to actually start looking and, and testing these things out and seeing for yourself the types of changes and responses you'll get. Because it's it's almost a little weird how well some of the kids do. And when they respond, they respond really quickly. We're not talking you treat them for six months to see a tiny change. Like you treat them and then like two weeks later, the parents are like, I don't know what the hell you did, but th this is borderline like magic. It's weird. Um, so start off slow. You know, you can go up to 0.1 grams per kilo per day. Honestly, with me, at, at even some of the older kids is like a thousand milligrams. 
maybe 2000 milligrams, uh, I hit a point. So I, I just actually do very conservative dosing and usually it's enough and you, you honestly don't need to go that high. Like probably for, let's say two to six year olds, 50 milligrams, if you want it to be a little, you can, and you can see, you can easily go way higher. So you've got a huge degree of, uh, flexibility in terms of how much you can dose. Um, I'm sorry, this is the carnitine right here. I was talking about creatine. So creatine is also super, super helpful. And in some of the kids I'll actually use creatine. I was actually talking about carnitine right here. Um, but, but you can see you've got actually a huge window of uh, range in terms of where you go. And, uh, you know, I tend to be very lazy. So there's two to three times per day dosing. I actually don't do. I'll just do once a day dosing and you still get really good results. So keep in mind that, you know, Rossinol in, in producing this, he's, he's talking about his, you know, metabolic train wrecks. Fortunately, we're not dealing with the train wrecks. You know, uh, I, I send all my train wrecks uh, like with the fully autistic kids to, you know, people like Ross and all and let them deal with that. But with, with all of these other kiddos with, with a, a, f a very low dose, probably even less than the 30 milligrams per kilo and, and a tiny amount of the CoQ10, you may get really, really cool change to happen. Uh, there, there's a lot of combination products. I don't know if you guys have used any of these. Uh, for me, I... I used agape for a period of time and I really like it because it actually has some lithium. So for some of the kiddos that are going bonkers, the lithium component is great. Uh, I have no financial ties to any of these companies, so I can hopefully speak pretty freely. Agape is not the best tasting thing on the face of the planet. And a lot of the parents actually complained. And when I tasted it, it it's not great. They also put some N-acetylcysteine in there, which is awesome. Uh, also makes it taste not so great. Uh, this has become my favorite uh, product. You guys, if you set up an account with them, I think you can get it for 50 something bucks a uh, thing, which lasts, you know, family two to three months. They buy it online for like $80. And part of what's cool about this spectrum needs, neuro needs is it pretty much covers everything. So um, when you don't want to use your brain, like, like me and most of my time, you know, and I, I don't even want to think about like where the issues are. And I just want to, you know, take a shotgun and just hit everything. Part of what the neuro needs does is it, it's basically the shotgun approach. It hits every single part of the metabolic pathway. So you don't even have to think about, you know, where the deficiency is. It is a little low in the carnitine or cre uh, yeah, carnitine. So sometimes, especially if there's a major error in fatty acid oxidation, I'll actually add a little bit more carnitine to it. Um, but, you know, with relatively little money, I'm, I'm sure for some families, you know, I understand that $80 or $70 is, is a lot of money and they may not be able to afford it. But sometimes even in these cases, I, you know, when I talk to these families, I, I'll tell them like, you know, look, like, there is a chance that X, Y, and Z things in your kid will change and they will change pretty dramatically. And it may be worth you trying this. And what's been amazing is like some of these families basically go talk to their friends or relatives and they'll get the $50 or $80 or whatever. And, you know, if, if money is really tight, just start with carnitine. You know, the carnitine is like 15 bucks, 20 bucks for a bottle that'll last them two months. Just give them some carnitine to start if money is really tight. So there's, there's ways to dance around this depending on your, you know, patient population, depending on their financial resources and, you know, availability. Some people, even if the money is tight, they're like, yeah, $80. If my kid's life is going to change hundred percent, I'll do it in a heartbeat. Um, and I, I encourage you to, you know, find whichever one you're comfortable with and just play around with these because you will be surprised by how much change you get and how much better these kids do when you start changing their foundation. And now all of this is to take us back to the terrain. All of this is to take us back to the terrain because ultimately when the gastrointestinal tract, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the nervous system, the skeletal muscle, and all of the things the skeletal muscle impacts, when all of these different factors that we touched on are not working and we don't need a ca catastrophic collapse in an organ system, sorry. We don't need a catastrophic collapse in an organ system. You know, we don't need pancreatitis to show up. 
You don't need full-blown liver failure, even though some of these kids will have mild elevations in their GGT or liver enzymes. All of these things collectively are what dictate the terrain and create a terrain that looks like this. And in a terrain like this, you could use any plant mixture you want in the most absurd doses and nothing will happen. I'm sure you guys have had you know, patients where you've supplemented them and they get maybe a tiny bit better and then slide backwards. Or you, you've, tra- you've tried treating various things and the treatments work kind of, and then you know, two weeks later, just like, what the hell? Why is this not working? If the terrain is dried out and parched and crappy, no treatment that you do will work that well if it works at all. And part of why I brought this up is without us understanding this, I can teach you about every plant under the sun and teach you every mechanism that those plants do. And you guys can use those plants until the cows got home, come home, but they will not work. They will not work well. And then you, you turn around and say, well, the plants didn't work. No, it's because you didn't know how to use them effectively in the right scenario. And the plants in particular are very, very finicky. You have to know exactly how to use them. You have to know exactly in what circumstance to use them. And when you know the right terrain to, to use the plants, that's when the plants become borderline magical. Like it, it's almost like you, you're, you're putting potions together. And the, the response that kids have, whether it's failure to thrive issues, digestive issues, mood issues, because that's the area that I'm interested in. You know, like the kids that I see that have had like, three months of, you know, tantrums. This is like in a six-year-old tantrums that are lasting 45 minutes. I'll give them a tincture, understanding their terrain. And then two weeks later, like the tantrums are completely gone. The, the kid that was flipping out of their mind suddenly is, is no longer having any issues. So all of that is possible when you understand the terrain. And the mitochondria are probably one of the most integral foundational pieces to understanding the terrain and understanding how to turn the terrain from one picture into another. And with that, I will now close my mouth and say thank you and uh, open it up for you guys to start asking questions. Bethman, I just had a question about the liquid carnitine. So I just looked it up and it, the only one I can find by now is 3000 milligrams of L-carnitine per tablespoon. Is that the one you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's 3,000 milligrams per 15 ml is what is I- Is it per 15 ml or 5 ml? Per tablespoon is what it says. I just wanted to make sure that's the product. So that they can. have, I think there's another one. So they have a regular one that I think is 3,000 per 15, and they may actually have a triple strength that's per 5 ml. But yeah, okay, that, that's the one that I'm talking about. That's the about. one you're talking yeah. about? Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Um, I have a question. Sure. I Am I still mute or- no, no, I can hear you. Okay, all right. So I have been using this Neurospectrum because I really like this combination vitamin with the kids that I see with Spectrum. Mm-hmm. But I like to first use the all-star prebiotic, probiotic. You know, I want to sort of, I feel like I don't want these uh, vitamins and supplements to be kind of feeding into the bad bacteria as well. That's been my thought. So when I work with kids, I normally first still go with the prebiotic, probiotic and use it as a powder. Are you familiar with using the all-star product at all? Uh, not specifically them. I, I, I am in love with prebiotics and probiotics. So, uh, you know, especially with the kids that don't know how to eat or chew. Uh, right. I love doing that combination. And uh, I, I totally agree with you that at least laying some foundation of the gut is, is definitely important. Yeah. I mean, I like, I'm not promoting this brand, but I've seen that it's very easy to give as a powder form. So just like I use the spectrum. So mm-hmm. I first a couple of months of getting the pre probiotics in and then I make them add in the, the whole other support, but I haven't, you know, I, I love that. I, I'll have to check them out. I, I use a lot of Prothera. So I use their biotogen. Right. So that, right. And that's my, one but, thing that's it's yeah. got a fiber in it. So just because I've been using that as well, I just found this a helpful combo and it's convenient for, you know, we know so many things, but how do we combine it and make it easy you know, that's where it comes down to. So, you know, that's what we're, I'm happy that you shared this with us. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I, I'll definitely look at the All Star product. Hey, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, I have a seven month old in my practice who 
can't lift his head up. Hmm. You know, very, very hypotonic. Um, he's huge though. He doesn't have any difficulty feeding at all. Mom didn't want to breastfeed, so he's a formula fed baby. He's seen neuro. He's going to have an MRI. He's seen genetics. Who's ordered a, you know, urine organic acids, all the things that geneticists usually work. And they're poor. These are poor people. And so I'm thinking, according to what you just said, it sounds like there wouldn't be any harm in just starting him on some carnitine and CoQ10. Even if yeah. you have a diagnosis, just treat him empirically in that way. I would. I would. You know, this is where things get kind of frustrating because the geneticists and metabolic people, you know, God bless them for what they do. And, you know, they're keeping kids from dying. They're also looking for absolute catastrophes. And, uh, you know, I, I've run into a lot of scenarios where the patients have first seen, you know, the geneticists and they've done the workup and everything is quote unquote normal. And then they come to me and I'll, I'll treat them. And all of a sudden there's still a response or, or I'll test them. And, you know, the urine organic acids that are run through the regular labs, when you look at their reference ranges, those reference ranges are set for detecting catastrophes. So, you know, sometimes what I'll like, the family is like, well, we, we had a urine organic acid and I'll tell them like, yeah, and I can't interpret it because the reference ranges are completely off or different than what I can use. And then I'll run it through a company like Great Plains. If you actually wanted to do that. And you'll actually see that the reference ranges are different. And what Great Plains calls abnormal is actually different than what the hospital does. Uh, but I, I would say it, it's absolutely fine to, to do a treatment. And, you know, if anything, start on the lower reference range. And if you guys want, I can post uh, this uh, dosing guide that Rossinol, uh produced just for you guys to have. But I, I think it's absolutely fine to do that. And yeah, why not? Yeah, that would be great. And I was curious about um, what Anu was, was mentioning. I looked up Metagenics Carnitine too, and I couldn't find, I can't find the one that you're talking about. So, so it's Metagenics like CoQ10. So they have a CoQ10 chewable. So it, it's a, I don't know exactly what flavor it is, but it's a 300 milligram ubiquinone. So technically ubiquinol it absorbs a little bit better. I haven't found a ubiquinol chewable. Uh, NeuroNeeds actually has a ubiquinol, which is actually very inexpensive. So I think their ubiquinol is like 45 bucks, which is one of the, the lesser expensive high-grade CoQ10s. And there are some families that actually just open the capsules and just squeeze out the content and just give it like that. Um, and that, that can certainly work. Um, but a way to translate ubiquinol to ubiquinone for, for those of you that haven't had ubiquinol, just because of its absorption into the cell is somewhere between three to five times probably as, as effective. So you have to use more of ubiquinone than ubiquinol. And you'll see on Rossinol's dosing sheet, there's a little bit of a difference between those two compounds. So they're, even though they're very similar, they're not equal in that sense. So you can't, I'm a real a newbie at this. You, you can't send them to a store to get this stuff. I have to go buy it, like get an account. No, you, you could. Uh, so uh, right. NeuroNeeds actually sells uh, over the counter. So you could, they can just go to the Spectrum Needs or NeuroNeeds website and it's, just buy it directly. What, what's that called? NeuroNeeds? So it, it's uh, right here. Um, right here. Okay. So they, they can go directly and just buy it from them. It's actually cheaper than if, if you were to buy it and sell it to them. Okay. Uh, and then if you just type in Metagenics CoQ10, I'm sure there's some websites that sell it too. And the carnitine okay. is just, I mean, that, that's available everywhere. Okay. So yeah, okay. you don't have to get that fancy. Okay. I was wondering if anybody uh, is using, so I often use a patch called CoQ10 carnitine. It's through patchmd.com. Hmm. So this is an interesting concept, you know, so I was a little skeptical about it. I learned about it a couple of years ago at a functional medicine conference I went to about this, this like the nicoderm, the, the same transdermal. I find I have used a lot of the patches off that website and I have no, there's no evidence for it. So it's all anecdotal from my practice. I use the iron patch a lot in children who won't take iron orally, but uh -huh. I have used the CoQ10 carnitine patch and I was trying to pull it up um, to see exactly what's in it exactly. But I mean, it has obviously has CoQ10 and carnitine and it has some of the other herbal support. And 
I have to say that I do see um, a clinical response to it, um, especially you know when we have some of these kids, um, they're already taking 50,000 supplements and to add in another set of supplements on top of that, I find that the patch has value. I was just wondering if anyone else has used it. And um, I, 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 that's what, kind of my go-to, that, that case I posted, the 16-year-old, I just saw him last week because I started him on the patch. You had asked why he's only on CoQ10. That's what he came to me on from the, meta, from the mitochondrial you know, doctors, I guess, somewhere in Wisconsin as a geneticist and neurologist to put him on CoQ10. But I've just started him on the patch because he has a G-tube and he already has a lot of oral issues mm. about food. And I'm going to just see how he does in the next 30 days. Um, so I was just curious if anybody was using that. No. How expensive is it? Is it cheaper or... You know, I'm just curious um, for the younger kids. Yeah, it's about forty dollars for thirty patches. Okay. Um, which is not bad, um, okay. compared to some of the supplements and so yeah, it, it just uh, it, it it just seems like a, a, a like you mentioned the gut is so unhealthy in these children that I don't even know how much of these supplements they're actually absorbing when we give them. So sometimes the patches are. Um, Oh, helpful point. yeah um, and again it's not all kids respond to them so again you know um clearly as i'm learning today there are so many variables in mitochondrial health um but anyway i was just curious if that was another thing that um people are using and i can i can post it in the group yeah please also. yeah please yeah i just i just found it i knew but i didn't i didn't find it with um carnitine i found no, it has it has carnitine in it yeah, it, it has. Does. If you read read the contents, it says acetyl L carnitine in it in the in the little product at the bottom. It's not do you know listed. How much, do you know how much carnitine is in there? I don't think they list it. That's the okay. thing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I I think at the end of the day, if your patient is getting better, that's all that matters. Um, the the one question that I would have, I mean, the carnitine dosing, you have to get pretty high levels or relatively high levels. So I wonder if they can do that through the patch. Maybe they they have. Um, I think it's a really cool idea. Okay. What about just prescribing it? You know, like because it's because I also do a day or two in Harlem Hospital, then I have a private. So parents, you know, it's nice to get even if you can get prescription. If you have experience, but, uh, Ron, what do you like using? In terms of prescribing it? Right, because neurologists prescribe it. I mean, I don't know about CoQ10. Uh, but the carnitine can be prescribed. Yeah, the car so you can prescribe Carnitor. Carnitor, uh, right. And th that, that's a prescription grade uh, carnitine. The problem that I've found is sometimes by the time people have gone through their insurance and paid their copay, they're actually paying more for the prescription. I mean, some people have excellent insurance and it covers everything. Sadly, these days, I, I don't trust insurance companies because a lot of times people end up paying through the nose. And the, the pharmaceutical grade or prescription grade uh, carnitines can get quite pricey. Uh, so in, in the circumstance where someone asks me for it, uh, I'll be happy to give them a prescription. But ultimately, a, you know, going and buying something online may be actually less expensive than even paying the copay. Um, okay, that's a so, good point. I didn't realize that. Yeah, so, um, uh, Medi Medicaid covers um, Medicaid covers carnitine and CoQ10. So I see almost seventy percent of the population I see on Medicaid, and I have used the prescription carnitine. It's not a great product; and it's not very palatable, but they will cover CoQ10 gummy or a chewable and a carnitine. Yeah, they oh, will. Great. That's good to know. Okay. I see a lot of Medicaid too. Do, um, do, do they cover the liquid for babies? Yeah, the liquid carnitine. Yeah. How does How does that come? What it comes as, I think it's 500 milligrams per teaspoon, I think, if I remember right, yeah. And um, it does, I have, I'm mean, actually run carnitine levels on all these patients. I found so many children with low carnitine levels. Mm. Um, I just sometimes, you know, I'm in an academic practice. And so sometimes when I'm, you know, doing these sort of things, if I have documentation, evidence that they actually have a carnitine deficiency, it's sort of, I mean, I know I'm not treating an isolated carnitine deficiency, but on paper, when I'm documenting my notes, it's, you know, it's had the value to show that there is a borderline carnitine deficiency when you're prescribing something. But um, yeah, I, I feel like, um, I, again, I, I think it, it does, again, not 100%, but I do feel like it helps these children to get, when, like I'm having the same experience when you give them a little bit of the 
cartoon with the CoQ10 that some things do improve, definitely. What is the So CoQ10 like with my, my hypotonic seven month old, would you suggest like starting with maybe like just 30 per kilo per day, like all in one dose? Yeah. You know, honestly, I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really gone that, that low. I mean, that young, I'm saying. I, most of the kids, I, I start out toddlers, you know, but. Yeah. You were just mentioning a hypotonic seven month old earlier. <laughs> so I was just wondering. So for me, I, I think, you know, if a seven month old would be probably what, around 10 kilos, eight kilos. Yeah. So I think, you know, two to 300 milligrams a day is, is fine. Uh, okay. So th they're bottle feeding or breastfeeding or? They're bottle feeding. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. I had a question sure. about the prescription CoQ10. I, I know. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, what dosage, what strength Medicaid covers CoQ10? Yes. So it's 500 milligrams per so teaspoon. And I, I also kind of, I go kind of like low on the lower end of dosing. So um, I think I usually use, let me just go back and see. I mean, I, I go, but I, I, I doze, I doze it sort of approximately. So if they're, if they're between one and two years, I, I do usually do 250 milligrams twice a day or 500 milligrams twice a day. It's very arbitrary. based. And then if they're two to three years, I find it very safe. Like there's no side effects. I never see any downside from giving it to them, but I start low and slow and then slowly build up. So do two weeks of a certain dose and then go a little higher. And I, I agree with Pedro, and I find like if I dose more than two or three times a day, they're not going to take it. So at least once a day, but, you know, yeah. Once a day is right. enough if they can get them to take it. If they can get it yeah, into them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the CoQ10 is, it comes as a sort of a, it's a, a little bit of a chalky chew. It's sort of like a Flintstones chew. So again, the quality of these products, I, I you can't speak for because, you know, but at least the, if the patient can't afford it, if they get it on a prescription, then they'll yeah. get it and they'll take it. And so, yeah. Do you think you have to get a lab panel, you know, to diagnose carnitine deficiency in order to do? No, I mean, yeah. I think nowadays, I because, you know, after all of these talks and all of these things, I think I have sort of a, a te in my smart phrases, I have a template built of like evidence for possible mitochondrial, secondary mitochondrial dysfunctions, so all of these, this data, you know, slow rolling, low muscle tone, so all the things that we, that were listed. And so I just say suspected, you know, a secondary yes, mitochondrial yes. dysfunction treating um, to support mitochondrial function. Um, you but you I agree think, with that, Peshman? Yeah, you, you yeah, agree? absolutely. Okay. okay, it's interesting. Thank you for that information. Sure. So would you, I, I have a couple questions in terms of um, family history with these kids. You know, I, I mean, everything that you had posted was talking about, it runs through the maternal line um, if, if it's a genetically, you know, but again, these are the, the extreme cases, right, that, they're, that the, they were talking about. Do you find that, like in your, in your example, you tested the father, and he was obviously his his acids was was off. What do you see in terms of you know of fami families? Like for instance, I have a a family. One child had low tone, all those issues, and now we're the, she's she's bringing me her the sibling who has anxiety and. ADHD, you know, and, and, and the, the child with low tone, I tested carnitine, carnitine was low, you know, and, uh, you know, and is doing great on CoQ10 and, and, um, and carnitine. You know, I'm just curious, like, again, just putting the bigger picture together, these kids, we assume they're going to need this stuff for the rest of their lives, right? And, yeah. and then, or no, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm like, where do we correct things and then the body can take over and so, do it? We... You know, I, I personally believe, and this is what I've seen, you know, in watching my own daughter and, you know, a handful of kids that I've been tracking over a while, that at some level, when you stop supplementing, their physiological functioning kind of starts falling back to a suboptimal level. 
uh, you know, for a lot of these kids, my daughter included, I'll just supplement them once or twice a week. And I, I find this kind of really, really nice state where uh, cost and, you know, pain of administering is really, really low. But at the same time, it's just enough to keep all of the physiological processes going. And the, the one organ that I see actually getting hit the hardest is the adrenal glands. Oddly, you know, we focus on everything else. The adrenal glands are very, very sensitive when it comes to metabolic functioning. Um, and with a lot of these kids, when I find that right space, and usually, again, once or twice a week dosing is enough to keep a lot of the organ systems happy, everything just runs at a suboptimal level. And, you know, in a way we are correcting ge the baseline genetic physiology, right? These kids would have a just quote unquote normal suboptimal level, which is just where they are and, you know, how much environmental factors are playing into it. I think that's a whole different can of worms. So in a way we're, we're taking the genetic subs or genetic baseline that's there and pushing it up to a level that it wouldn't be. And it's kind of like we're turning that scrawny guy into the muscular human being at the internal physiological level. So that, that's what I have found that uh, there's this magic happy space where it doesn't have to be every day. It could be literally once or twice a week, but you can see everything is just humming along. And when you watch these kids over months, they just hit this place where they don't get sick as often. Everything just runs more efficiently. Their nervous systems behave more optimally. Uh, everything is just better. Any other questions? This is just such a wonderful forum. I haven't been involved. For, I mean, I've been involved, but I, I'd love to know a little bit about each one of us because you become, did I miss the introductions? I'm so sorry I wasn't here last time. No, I don't think we've ever done a full uh, appropriate yeah, introduction. We are because, you know, we're engaging and this is such a wonderful community. I'm feeling like, you know, I'm getting support of a, a well, pediatricians and a family, you know, it's yeah. great to learn from each other and to talk, you know, because we get isolated with our work. Yes. Yeah. This is a gift. This is Bajman. I have to thank you for why that. Don't we, why don't we start with you? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, originally from Pakistan, but I've been here 35 years, you know, and I trained at Harlem. And can you imagine I'm back to help develop the program there at Harlem? But it's been a journey that I uh, went into child development at Hackensack and was director for 19 years at Beth Israel of child development. And I got pulled in with Woody Merrill and, you know, the whole crowd to do a break world fellowship with Andrew Weil and got into functional medicine and so I did lots of training and held conferences in New York hmm. on the development of feeds integrative medicine and got you know, Nancy O'Hara, Sid Baker, everybody to come and present, you know, so I was wanting to share. So the idea of doing conferences and then Mount Sinai took over Beth Israel and they went open to this department of integrative medicine, which we had there, which kind of shut down. So everybody oh. went and Woody keeps doing the, the meetings that he does, right? The integrative health symposium that he does in New York. So um, I stay connected to that. And then I uh, basically started my own practice in Chelsea, Manhattan um, since 2016. So I do a couple of days of practice. I've tried to work less. Um, and then I got this offer to come back and teach at Harlem Hospital because they wanted some back to basic teaching residents. And I said, you know what? The universe bringing me back to maybe <laughs> use Medicaid as well as, you know, so it's a mix. And you know, I struggle with, um, so that's what I'm doing. And I'm happy working from home and having colleagues. So you know, do, I'm delighted that you've done this and to have this connection with you. Yes. I, I can My keep pleasure. talking about different things, but I want to know about others now. Come on. <laughs> so who's next? Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm Anu French. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. So I practice pediatrics, integrative medicine, and some functional medicine here approaching 25 years in practice and I've just really been in a hospital owned practice for the last 20 years but in the last 10 years I also you know the Andrew Wild Fellowship kind of changed my direction completely and um, you know the practice kind of morphed from general peds to integrated peds just organically you know through word of mouth and 
So last year, my hospital um, supported opening a separate office just for integrative medicine. So it's been wonderful. We just finished a year there with our own team. And it's just, it's fantastic. We're booked out five, six months now of waiting list. And it's great. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, from, from my perspective, I think, you know, I, I do see, I'm sort of the person everybody sends the crazy hard you know complex cases too like there's sort of you know, the reputation of the clinic now is oh if you if we can't figure this out go see dr french and so we i think um i was talking to pejman earlier when we logged on before everyone else came on it's just that i feel like the more i learn the less i know the more i learn the more confused i get and the more i learn i feel like um i just am not bringing these children to optimal health so that's why i'm here i feel like i can do better you know i can definitely do better and we have I mean, I think almost I'm going to do, I just, I'm just finishing with an integrative psychiatry fellowship training through a new uh, integrative psychiatry institute through the University of Colorado. So just finishing that year up. And that's also kind of introduced me a whole nother, uh, you know, global community of, um, and this is mostly almost, I would say hundred, almost 90% of the people are psychiatrists who are doing this, which is such hope. It gives me so much hope that they want an integrative blend. And I'm there about five or six of us that are primary care. Is this with Scott and, Shannon? Is this the one that- Yeah, Scott well, is? actually it's Will Vanderveer. Scott Shannon is definitely, he does a lot of the keynote addresses and he's on the faculty with us, but um, Will Vanderveer is the, who was also doing those psychiatry masterminds initially, who they, they kind of stopped that. And he started this initiative. And I think the next year is booked out already. The next two years, I think they've already filled for because wow. it was just so popular. We were kind of the, the guinea pigs, the pilot <sighs> year. And so I, but I'm just saying that I just keep finding more and more um, that I need to do. So I think, and, and I just never realized that mitochondria is so important. I mean, like, you know, just how much it plays a role. So, and I'm just so interested in gemotherapy and, you know, all of this, I just feel like there's more to learn. So that's why I'm here. You did a wonderful presentation, Patman. Yeah, oh, thank you. It I was wonderful. All the systems, you're a fabulous thank presenter you. and teacher. Oh, thank you. you get accolade. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate having you here and uh, just having this collaboration and, you know, for us to be outside of our little bubbles is, is really yeah. a joy. You know, I've done some, I do some international work and I would love to, just the way I did conferences, I would love to have you as one of the conference speakers if we set something up. So, oh, I, I would be delighted agree to that because I'm dealing with a, um, a group that's between LA and Peshawar in Pakistan for parents with autism. So, <laughs> and this is so simple. So, you know, you would be on my faculty. <laughs> uh, I would be delighted. Yeah, I would be you. delighted. Uh, uh, Caroline, do you want to share a little uh, quick tidbit? Yeah, uh, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I actually did the uh, uh, met Anu. Uh, we did the uh, Andrew Weil Fellowship together and have continued learning, I think, together, although you've taken it a little bit further than I have. Um, and so I'm in a conventional practice. Um, and uh, as see probably more than 50% 60% Medicaid at least, um, but, uh, and I'm in Ithaca, New York. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting practice. I feel like the good part is I can, you know, as I always say, open the door and for people with, to give them options when they didn't know they had options. Um, but, uh, and people are starting to, you know, that word of mouth, I tell you, parents are, strong advocates. I'm getting people from two, three hours away traveling. And I'm like, but I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's interesting. And, um, and I really value this approach in the, in, I mean, I mean, I just, I, as you said, the more I'm learning, the less I know. And, uh, and it really makes me nervous because I think about all these kids who I've tried these other things, as you mentioned, and I'm like, it didn't work. Or what am I doing? So hopefully in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, quick question for you. So for all of you, uh, for the next conversation, uh, I'm trying to decide between talking about the structure and I know that for the group, I don't know if, for those of you here specifically, but collectively as the group, understanding how structure influences things is, is something that's lacking. So we can go down the craniosacral osteopathic route and just kind of do a 
broad overview of how structure Im- impacts function. And I'm actually thinking of uh, luring one of my you know, really smart osteopathic colleagues that all she does is osteopathic medicine to actually come and do a talk. Um, option two is we start diving into the hormones and talking about how hormones impact physiology and ultimately you know, the constitution of the kids. Um, any thoughts from those of you that are here? As a preference, we want it all, but my, I think it ties in nicely, but it's your call. Okay. Uh, any thought from I think ladies? hormones too. Yeah. I okay. really, yeah, I'd be interested. And I think at some point are we, uh, we will be getting to case discussions. Yeah. 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 Cause I feel like, I mean, I, this is the thing, I, I think all these forums I'm part of, you know, the most value I get is really when people talk about what they're actually doing on the ground, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, um, so, so that'd be great. Okay, okay. Caroline, you agree? Thumbs up? Hormones? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, okay, we'll, we'll do the hormones. And, you know, that'll be a fun place to start with the plants because uh, the plants actually have a lot of neuroendocrine impact. Uh, that's actually where a lot of their impact on the human physiology lays. So we'll, we'll okay. We'll, we'll talk about that and we'll start talking about the plants. And what I'll do is uh, this time I'll just have one topic, which will just be the you know, neuroendocrine system. So for those of you that have cases and questions, uh, you can kind of post there and we'll see how much we can get done in the next month. And if we need to do a secondary conversation, we will. Cool. All right. All right. Thank we you all have so a beautiful much. weekend. You're welcome. So You're welcome. Oh, great. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.